Today's sermon is titled, Right Size Your Request. Right Size Your Request. We have two passages of scripture today, relatively brief. We are continuing to work our way through the gospel according to Luke, and we're in a season this during the late spring and heading into summer focusing on prayer, and specifically right now the Lord's Prayer. So today, Luke chapter 11, verse 3. Hear now God's word. Give us each day our daily bread. And then to the prayer of Agur from Proverbs chapter 30, verses 8 and 9. If you are a member of this church for a while, you'll remember I preached specifically on this passage of Scripture a few years ago. I'm going to give you the NIV translation, which really better captures the, the meaning of Agur's prayer and also is more reflective of the meaning of the Hebrew. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Well, it's a common problem with Americans. I'm just going to be honest. I am an American. It's, it's a problem with, uh, probably with humanity in general. Let's be honest. We're fallen people. But I really see it a lot in America. Have you ever heard the, the, the saying, your eyes are bigger than your stomach? Eyes bigger than your stomach. Have you ever, maybe when you guys were in France, you know, at a restaurant, maybe eyes bigger than your stomach. You had a party. Anybody ever been guilty of that? I'm going to go ahead and confess it up front. I don't know if anybody else here has ever had eyes bigger than your stomach. Anybody else here going to, willing to confess this? Eyes bigger than your stomach. And, of course, that is, that's your classic um, guy right there, probably at a sports game. And that second or third hot dog and pepperoni roll is probably not going to go down really well. He may regret it. His family may regret it tomorrow. But he's going to stuff it all down because he's excited about his team. There he is, eyes bigger than his stomach. Now, this leads to problems at the literal physical level, heart problems, right? That is not good for your heart. <laughs> all that food, all that overflow of food, all that stuffing is not good for your actual physical heart, your cardiology. But of course, the problem goes deeper than that, and that's where we're headed today. The spiritual heart trouble of eyes being bigger than what you should be looking for. That's the real danger. Spiritually, I would tell you pastorally and theologically, the danger is grasping at and clinging to more than I'll take with me when I die. How much of this stuff are you going to take with you when you die? that you're holding on to right now, that you've just got to have, that you've just got to, and if you don't have it right now, you're coveting it. Because, but any of that stuff you're coveting, is it gonna go with you when you die? No, you don't take a thing with you. So that's a real danger, spiritually, of souls trying to grab at stuff that they're not gonna take with them when they die. It's not gonna help them out of the judgment. And even that your soul cannot handle right now. Let's just put death to the side for a moment. According to God, your soul is not designed to have everything and be grabbing it more and more. That's not good for your soul. That's not good for your character. So, right size your request. Right size your request is today's sermon. Now, related to and based off of Jesus' teaching for us in prayer, I've added another prayer that coincides with what we're focusing on today. And this prayer goes like this, and you have a fill in the blank in your sermon notes. So if you're following along in the sermon notes, you want to make sure you can fill in the blank. And this is one of the easier fill in the blanks that I'm ever going to give you. We'll see how smart you are. Okay, so here we go. Father, 
lead me to trust you. This is a prayer. Father, lead me to trust you. And therefore, do what to my eyes, my desires, and my request? Anybody remember the sermon title? I've said it to you about three times now. What goes in that blank? Right size, my eyes. Right size, my desires. Right size, my request. So I'm going to give you an even easier fill in the blank. It comes next. Jesus teaches us to pray this way. Father, give us each day our what? Can anybody fill in that blank? I hope you can. Daily bread. Now this, as it turns out, is our number one, our very first and number one personal supplication petition. As you've heard me preach through the Lord's Prayer so far, you know I've assigned this title. This is not something that everybody gives it. I just kind of came up with this. This is the first of our supplication petitions. In other words, now we're at the stage where we're asking God. You ever heard the word in like church called supplication? It means we're asking God to supply us. Okay? Now we're at the supplication petitions. Remember the pattern that Jesus teaches us to pray. This is essential for your faith life as well as your prayer life. Okay, remember the pattern. We've learned this over the last number of Sundays. And if you've missed Sundays, you've got to go back to the previous Sundays and listen to the sermons because they all pull together and take you through teaching you what it means to believe in Jesus, to follow Jesus, and to pray in the way he's teaching you. So remember the pattern, though. In general, let me give you the overall pattern. We start off with A, the address. And the address is not to ourselves. We're not praying to ourselves. We're not praying to some number of gods out there that we don't know and just kind of throwing spaghetti up on the wall and hoping something hits. We are specifically turning to God, our Father, and praying to him as our trusted Father whom we obey and listen to in our prayer. So remember, the address is to Father. Now next, we spent a couple Sundays on this. So again, go back to these sermons if you missed them. We then come to be the what I'm calling adoration petitions. Or you could say adorational petitions grammatically if you wanted to. But these are adorations even before and beyond when they're petitions. We're not bossing God around with these prayers. We are saying, calling on the glory of God's name, that it would be upheld as holy. Remember, we preached about that. You can dig into that from the previous sermon a couple weeks ago. And then last Sunday, the gospel revolt. Remember the gospel revolt? Pray your reign come. Your kingdom come. So those are the adorational, adoration slash petitions. But now finally, we come to see the supplication petitions. In other words, we're personally asking God to supply us now. When we finally get to our personal request, you're going to sit there and ask, probably, why this one? I mean, think about this. Why is this even there in the first place among the, per Matthew, four supplication requests we're going to give, per Luke, more compact, three we're going to give? Why is this even in the list? And on top of that, why is it number one? I have to tell you, this is shocking to me as a pastor. Because, from, from ground level, before I turn up to God, okay, because... Everybody on our prayer list, if you look at our prayer list, none of those folks called me up or came to me pastorally and said, would you please pray for me? Put me on the list because I, June, need daily bread. That's what, that's what my prayer request is, daily bread. I, you know, when I'm in Bible studies and people say, are there any prayers? I've never had anybody yet. You can surprise me. You could be the first one. I'd love it if you would. I've never had, in all my years of pastoring, you know, over 30 years, I've never had somebody say, oh, I've got a prayer request. I need daily bread. I need some bread for today or tomorrow. Because we live in the Western bubble where we have everything. You know, we're not actually anxious about are we going to have food on our table tonight or tomorrow. And beyond that, bread is not just about literal bread. It's about kind of basic sustenance. So, but why? Why this one? Why this one first? And you could say, well, maybe, I don't know, Jesus is trying to just get us regrounded and give us some mundane request before we get to the really spiritual ones like 
forgiveness, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and you know, deliver us from evil or the evil one. Is that what this is? Is this a mundane request before that really deep spiritual ones? And you've got a blank there. What do you think the answer is? Is Jesus just dumbing down our prayer life right now? What's the answer? Is it yes or no? The answer is no. No, absolutely this is not mundane or dumbing down our prayer life. In fact, here's the truth. I'm going to tell you the honest truth now. We cannot theologically, spiritually, as a faith matter, arrive at addressing the issues of forgiveness of our sin and our forgiving other people and being delivered from the evil one or from evil without first praying in faithful trust, give us our bread. Why is that? Well, I'm going to tell you why that is. Jesus is deep. And Jesus understands that when we get down to our supplications, okay, our, our supplication petitions, we got two bad boys that are right in our face and trying to take us over. And these bad boys are called greed and pride. Greed and pride. And the first supplication, number one at the top of the list that Jesus gives us for our supplication petitions, focuses on greed and pride. And here's the prayer. Let me elaborate the prayer. May I not be a slave to greedy eyes. May I not pridefully grasp for more than my soul can handle. Oh, well, let me get my smartphone. I got to find out something else. I got to like pile on. I need more. Maybe I can order more. No, no, no. Let it go. Let me not be a slave to greedy eyes and pridefully grasp for more than my soul can handle. No, may I trust in and live by the word of my Father only. That's what Jesus is teaching us to pray like. Why is Jesus focusing us on requesting food and basic provision to take us in the direction of where we're going to continue to pray? Sanctification, you know, forgiveness of sin, deliverance from the evil one. It has to do with the kingdom key of trusting God's word and God's grace alone. In other words, to be people of peace and what Paul would call contentment instead of being greedy grabbers. So you can go one of two directions here, okay? There's two types of person to be, a greedy grabber, that's what we are in our sin, a greedy grabber for a child of grace. Which one you're going to be? Jesus is inviting you to pray in the direction of a child of grace, not a greedy grabber. Give us our daily bread. Where's this coming from? Well, all you need to do is look back at the basic Bible story. Let me give you a couple of highlights that totally connect with, and Jesus is clearly connecting them with the way he's teaching us to pray. First of all, back to the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. So the serpent is tempting the woman. You remember the story, right? Beginning of chapter 3 of Genesis. And uh, he's tempting the woman to mistrust and actually to turn against God and God's word. Do not trust his word. You can't trust him. You need to take over. You need to grab all the gusto. You deserve it. You know, Satan is a wonderful marketer. He basically writes all the stuff that we see on TV telling us to buy stuff, right? Okay, so you need to grab all the gusto you can. You deserve it. Take over. You'll be your own God. You'll decide good and evil for yourself, what's right and what's wrong for you in your own heart. You know, Satan really has the woman going. And then we get to verse 3. Excuse me, verse 6 of Genesis chapter 3. Now listen to verse 6, and I want you to listen to the verbs. I'm, I'm going to come back and highlight these verbs. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, I mean, just look at this. This is gorgeous. She took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. 
So here's Eve being tempted by the serpent to mistrust, turn against God's word. Eve set her eyes and her desire on the fruit of the tree of knowing good and evil for herself. And it just got better and better looking, man. You just can't get enough of this stuff. And then notice what she does. She, the Hebrew here is very decisive. She took. She ate. And then get the picture. She takes and feeds her husband. She, the creature, the woman, gives the food to her husband. And he eats. You understand we just had a major revolution here. Not just the first part of that story. You understand in Genesis, who feeds us at the beginning? God, God only. How does he feed us? How does he create a garden where we can eat to our heart's content and he's going to provide for us? How does he do it? By his what? Does he come down and like grow everything? No, by his word. Are you with me on this? To be a person of faith, we are fed by and under the word of God. But now all of a sudden we have a creature, the man's woman, who's going to give him the food. The food she's picked out. And he eats. Everything is turned on its head. If you've never studied Genesis 3, it just it's basically a life study. It, it, it tells the whole story of sin. So she takes, she eats, and she gives. She gets in the place of God and gives. You know, every time I do a wedding and I go to the, you know, the, the, the feast afterwards, and, and, and you know, the, the bride and the groom are stuffing cake into each other's faces, I think about this. And it's like, okay, is this, is this marriage going to be based on what we heard at the service, which is that we are fed by the word of God, or is it going to be wife and husband trying to feed each other and give each other? Well, we'll see, right? Each, each marriage plays out its own course. Man, daily bread in the desert. Now, if you didn't get the Eve story, you got to get this one. This is obvious. Jesus is totally connecting with the manna story uh, of the Israelites, the Hebrews in the desert. God's word, when God provided manna to the Hebrews in the desert, called for a faith response to his gift, to his grace. And the faith response was this, seek and take only, only a daily portion, only. God said, here are the rules. There's going to be a lot of manna. And by the way, the color of it is going to reflect a color of a jewel that was in the Garden of Eden. I mean, so it's, it's, really, it's really interesting going on here. And the rule, God said, is you take only one day's worth. And for the Sabbath, because I don't want you working on the Sabbath, you'll take two, and the bread will last that, you know, for that second day for the Sabbath. But otherwise, you only take one, okay? Why is God doing this? Well, as the Lord God explains to Moses, this is from Exodus chapter 16, verse 4, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, every day, just a day's portion. Why? That I may test them whether or not they will walk in my Torah, my instruction. Are you going to live by my word or are you going to do it your way? Daily manna is the test. And then, of course, we get the reiteration by Moses in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 8, verse 3 which Jesus cites, Jesus claims this verse and claims the meaning of this verse as he withstands the temptation of the devil in the desert. Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. He humbled you, Moses said, and let you be hungry, and then he fed you, okay? That's your wife, not your husband. And he fed you with the manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, why? Why do you do this? So that he might make you understand that man shall not live by bread. And the Hebrew here is lechem. It means bread, but it also means like food in general. By bread alone, 
but by every word, the bar, that comes from the Lord's mouth. This is the verse that Jesus cites in withstanding the temptation, the, the onslaught of the beginning of the temptation with the devil in the desert. And so Jesus teaches us to pray also. Give us our lechem in the Hebrew, right? And I love this. Margot Swain just happened to give this to me yesterday. It's from the early 1900s. And it was done by the Baptist Church, not, not here locally, like the National Baptist Church. And it's a little child's Bible and devotional called Daily Food. Daily Food. I am the bread of life underneath. So that's, that's what we're called to pray for. But let me get you in the weeds for just a minute, and it's going to help with three ways I'm going to ask you and invite you to see what this prayer means in different dimensions and different directions. So Jesus teaches us to pray, give us our, and in the Greek, in Matthew, and in Luke, it's an odd term. Not the first word's not odd. Artan, which means, artos means bread, okay, or food, like, like lechem in Hebrew. But artan epiusian. What is that? Artan epiusian. Well, here's the reality. That term, Arton Epiusian is only used three times in all of ancient Greek, and it's all specifically Christian, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 4, in Luke chapter 11, verse 3, and in the Didache, which I mentioned in a recent sermon. I've talked about the Didache before, but you, you'll know the Didache is the earliest, probably the earliest extra-biblical document of the early church training disciples in how to follow Jesus, and it gives the Lord's Prayer there and says you're supposed to pray it three times a day, okay? So nowhere else, not in Aristotle, not in Plato, not in Homer, this term, Martan, Epiusion, is not used. And let me just tell you, there are four or five Greek terms for daily that much more easily could be used off the top of my head. Ephemeros definitely means daily and passing away. Okay, that, that would be an obvious one to use. So what's going on here? Well, because um, epiousios, that means on essence. Remember Nicene Creed, homoousion, the same essence or substance, three persons, same. Epi, okay, homoousion, okay. So what's going on here? What are we talking about? The, the essence or the following upon, it could also mean. Well, here's a key clue or help. Luke, the writer of Luke, in Acts, five times uses the related term, epiuse, to talk about a coming day or the next day, or something that is coming up, okay? So he probably is trying to signal to us, give us the bread for the coming day. Um, let me go ahead and go to the three main interpretations. There are probably about six or seven that compete in the scholarly realm of the New Testament. But these three are the main ones. They're the predominant ones. What are we praying for? In what direction are we praying? Here's the first one. Give us bread, in other words, basic sustenance, daily food, sufficient to make it through today. And what is, if we're praying that way, and I invite you to pray this way. I'm going to be inviting you to pray all three of these ways I'm going to give you. Okay? It's, it, this is in the notes, too. This means we need to get of our little Western you know, indulged bubble, because most of the world and most of humanity through most of history has been worried about how they're going to feed their family for the day at hand. We're not worried about that. Let's just be honest. We're, most of us are not. I never get that on the prayer list. I'm worried about food. I don't know if I can feed my family today. I just don't get that from my typical congregations, right? But this, we are being invited, as Richard Balcom, the New Testament theologian, says, to pray like day laborers, to get in the mode of a day laborer. Remember, most of the people Jesus is preaching to and calling to follow him are day laborers. It's a big deal for them to get a denarius, which is a pay for a day's work. Remember, most of his parables, you know, he talks about the great king and the great banquet, but he's talking about God. He doesn't, Jesus doesn't tell parables about, oh, the politics like that would be covered on MSNBC or Fox News. He's not into all this politics and capital intrigue and stuff like this. He's talking about daily work and daily fields. 
See, when Jesus invites his people and invites you and me to pray, we need to pray like that, like day laborers who know, you know what, even if I have a lot of stuff, it can all be snapped out of my hand in a moment, and when I die, it definitely is snapped out of my hand. So I better come before the Lord humble, like a day laborer, and pray like that. That's number one. Uh, number two, this is another interpretation, and this is a good direction to pray. Give us bread, in other words, basic sustenance, essential for the coming day. Now that's more along the lines, I think, where Luke is indicating. But again, no more than for the coming day. Now, what's going on here? I am trusting, particularly, this is a great way to pray in the afternoon and evening. I'm going to trust the Father and his pledges, his promises, and his provisions for the day ahead. I'm not going to worry about the day ahead. I'm going to pray and ask God to provide. Not what I need for the next five years, but what I need for tomorrow. Literally, the coming day, tomorrow, literally. And that's a good way to pray. Give me what I'm going to need for tomorrow. Nothing more. I, I'm not asking for a whole bunch of stuff, but I just want to make it through tomorrow. And I want my children to make it through tomorrow. So, the coming day. And then third, this goes deeper now. Give us bread essential for the coming day of the Lord. For the Messianic King's Banquet. And this is the way a lot of Jews were thinking in Jesus' day. Uh, for instance, in Luke chapter 14, Jesus is instructing and he says, But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. And then one of the people who's reclining with Jesus when he's teaching says this, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. That means blessed is everyone who's going to be in on the kingdom, in on eternal grace with God, in on the age to come with Jesus, with, with the Lord. That's kind of what this guy is saying. And Jesus, of course, when he gives the Last Supper, says, I will not eat of this bread again until I eat it with you in the kingdom of God, right? I will not drink of this cup until I drink it again with you in the kingdom. So that's kind of the way this... You can understand this to be going, and I intentionally included it in the call to worship because this is the way Jesus is talking in John chapter 6. Then Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you now the true bread from heaven. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Do you pray for Jesus? When you pray for daily bread, you're ultimately praying to be with Jesus in the ultimate communion. Pray all three ways. I would advise all three ways. Today, literally tomorrow, but no more. And then ultimately what matters, the bread of heaven with Jesus forever. As we learn to pray Jesus' way that he's teaching us, notice, whichever way you read bread, you're talking about praying all the time. C.S. Lewis, in his letters to Malcolm, says this, that to pray the Lord's Prayer and specifically to pray for daily bread reminds us of this. Relying on God has to begin all over again every day as if nothing had been done yet. That's the way to start your day, every day, totally opening yourself to the Lord. Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. How often? One time in their whole life at a big youth rally? No, deny himself daily and follow me. Go with Jesus. As we come to his table, let us trust in the Father to give us all we'll ever need and come with hands that are not grabbing onto other stuff. Yeah, be set free. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. 
If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.